Hey everyone, welcome to chapter 14 with our flexibility training for our seventh, seventh edition of the NASM uh, CPT training certification program. So we're gonna knock out flexibility training, which, you know, with that sequence of everything, we, we were really talking about how chapter 13 kind of lumped everything together. Chapter 14 really is gonna work on getting everything in the right order. All right, so that we can start to really say, okay, flexibility, then we're gonna move into cardio, then we're gonna move into core balance, okay? So we're gonna keep progressing through each one of these. So as we go through, just remember, it's each step of your training program based on that integrated training model that we had talked about, okay? So there's your learning objectives down there on the bottom. So let's just get right into it. So flexibility, you know, probably one of the most underappreciated of them all. All right, um, we have to make sure that proper flexibility can lead to everything, proper muscular endurance, proper strengthening, proper, you know, it doesn't really matter what it is, it's just a simple fact that we can continuously you know, change if our flexibility is up to date. Um, so you know, again, that's, this is the first step. So what is it? Normal extensibility of all soft tissues that allow the complete range of motion of a joint. So basically being able to move through the full range of motion without having any sort of issues that will apply back to you, okay? Now, what is the purpose of this? You know, again, achieving that, you know, greater amount of extensibility is going to be, you know, basically, it's gonna be more about that term mobility, okay? Which is flexibility plus joint range of motion. So don't assume that flexibility means mobility. They're two separate entities. Flexibility is a component of mobility. So that is the, the key there. You can be flexible, but you know you may not be able to put your joint through full range of motion. You might be flexible and you might not be able to put your joints through a full range of motion. There might be other subtleties that are preventing that from happening, all right? So you know that's where we have to make sure that we're well aware of what is going on at that point in time, especially with each one of our people because every one of us is gonna have an individual amount of mobility based on our flexibility. So, you know, these are some of those factors I was kind of hitting on. Genetics, okay? Myofascial tissue elasticity, or like it says here, connective to myofascial, you know, basically that outer perimeter of the muscle for the most part. A composition of the tendons or the, the skin surrounding the joint. Now, you like skin, but yeah, if you have scar tissue, things like that, that can make a big difference. The joint structure, okay? Just itself, how yours is made up versus someone else's, like how your scapula is shaped versus another person's, all right? You, just, you know, how, how long is your femur compared to another person's, etc. The strength of the opposing muscle groups can play a difference. Body comp, your gender, age, activity level, previous injuries or other existing medical conditions, and then repetitive movements. Now, with repetitive movements, Basically, we're just meaning continuous, you know, overload to that, that's going to be provided that's going to basically hinder your flexibility. So, you know, poor flexibility can lead to what we would call altered movement patterns or what we would call relative flexibility. All right. So at that point there, you know, our, our body really just tries to work along a line of what we would call the path of least resistance. So if our normal path is blunted or it's stopped, then we basically have to understand that in that moment, we are basically not being able to pull with that line of direction. So therefore, what we would have to do is we have to be able to go through and really it has to be, uh, you know, it, the body has to change and adapt. So that's why, that's why you have new poorer movements than what we normally would have. All right. So there's two examples here. People who squat now, if you start with your feet slightly externally rotated, that could be potentially a proper squat positioning. But if you're squatting and your feet are externally rotated that degree, like this person up here in this top section, whoop, you know, with her feet, you know, kind of moving, you know, way out wide, like penguin stance, or when that person is squatting down and that moves in that direction, that's a problem. Same thing down below where you'd have the person who is trying to reach overhead who is, you know, they're doing an overhead, you know, strict press or shoulder press, whatever you want to call it, military press. 
and they go into what we would call lumbar extension or uh, looks like slight lordosis. And that is really like it says there, decreased sagittal plane shoulder flexion. So therefore what you end up with is an ability for your arms to move directly overhead. You see that person's shoulders are not stacked correctly. They're a little bit more anterior than they would be, you know, a little bit more neutral. So we have to be aware that the nervous system is not recruiting the right muscles the right way because the path of least resistance is like basically disrupted in some way. So, you know, we got to be aware that, you know, muscle groups are going to be dictated by, you know, that ability of, you know, that flexibility amount. So if you are not able to have the proper flexibility of very specific muscles, then basically what we're doing is we're, we're not going to have proper body control. Okay. So we have to be able to provide a specific amount of techniques in the right manner so that we can adjust and work with everybody in their own manner to get the right extensibility and in all planes of motion, sagittal, frontal, and transverse. All right. And here's just a couple of examples here talking about the lats, the biceps femoris, or the your your very strong, very powerful main hamstring muscle, and then your gastrocnemius, and how all three of them have sagittal, frontal, and transverse plane in implications. Okay. Just, you know, three of a few that are like that manner. Okay. So, you know, we have to understand too that with flexibility, the kinetic chain, which we know about muscular system, skeletal system, and nervous system, all right, if that, if any one of those is disrupted through flexibility, it's going to affect the other, which is going to affect the other, which means if the nervous system or if the muscular system is having a, you know, is, is off or tight or whatever you want to call it, you know, um, you know, overactive, then ultimately what's going to happen is that muscular system, the nervous system is not going to allow the muscular system to fire those muscles because it's like, why? It's not feeling good. And then therefore your skeletal system doesn't, those joints do not move correctly. So you can see where it can become very, very challenging. So that kinetic chain, we've talked about this a little bit before too. You know, the upper kinetic chain and the lower kinetic chain, you know, shoulder, elbow, wrist, hip, knee, ankle, and foot, you know, basically from pelvis down and then pelvis up. Okay. Um, so, you know, we, we can, we have our upper and lower kinetic chain and that can, you know, those kinetic chains can cause certain muscular imbalances. Like it says on the right here. All right. Those muscular imbalances can lead to eventual poor posture. Those poor postures lead to lead to horrible movement patterns or improper movement patterns, which eventually lead to an injury of some state. All right. And this is really what we would call postural, dis postural distortion patterns. When your muscles become imbalanced, they lead to that postural change, which leads to the movement change, which lead to an injury because of that cumulative effect. Okay. So we have to be aware that if we see these imbalances, we have to catch them by doing things like the overhead squat assessment or the single leg squat assessment or the push or the pull assessment. This is why we do those because we see where things are out of whack, out of alignment. Okay. So we have to be aware of that. So static postural distortions and altered movement patterns are what it's going to lead to, and it's not a proper positioning for that. And we have to be aware that at any point in time, you know, this can happen to anybody, whether you're a high level exerciser or a low level exerciser, it just doesn't matter. So again, with those muscle imbalances, alterations in length of the muscles surrounding a joint, you know, and if you look in the background of the, of the still shot in the very background, the faint, you know, there's your muscle balance. You've seen this picture before, blew it up a little bit bigger here, but the muscle imbalance, you know, your shortened muscle on the left side, your, you know, your lengthened muscle or your underactive muscle on the right side. And by doing that, that imbalance will lead to prop, improper pulls. So then you end up with these things down here on the bottom, postural distortions, which we talked about from this slide right here you know, the, the imbalances, which lead to the injury eventually that takes time though. Repetitive movements, that cumulative effect. So there's that cumulative trauma because of repetitive movements or that constant overload, emotional distress, people who care, you ever heard of people who carry their, their stress in their neck or so be it. Um, poor training technique, just improper movement while training can cause wrong muscles to fire, causing imbalance. Poor bodily control, you know, if people are not walking correctly, even that can make a massive difference in everything. And then a biased training pattern, which basically means here that we 
our, you know, at, at that point in time, our bias training patterns, we're really saying to ourselves that we do not want um, to be able to constantly move in the same repetitive movement motion over and over again. Okay. So with our muscle imbalances, there we go. There's that cumulative injury cycle, which we don't want to get to. But again, muscle imbalances, you know, those are created based on, like it says there, altered reciprocal inhibition. So altered length tension relationships. We talked about that previously. You're, you're calling upon non-prime prime movers. There's your synergistic dominance where the synergists are now taking over. And then arthrokinematic dysfunction where you're basically saying that your skeletal, you know, your, your, your joint system is not moving correctly. Altered neuromuscular control, that point leads to tissue fatigue, and that tissue fatigue leads to the cumulative injury cycle, all right? So we have to be aware of all of those things because once that injury cycle takes into place, that's that true muscle imbalance. That's where you're, you know, even moving around, you're chronically feeling like you're hurt. So there's your first one, altered reciprocal inhibition, and your second one, synergistic dominance. So reciprocal inhibition is, like it says, simultaneous contraction of an agonist muscle and the relaxation of its antagonist. So if that is altered in any way, what we're saying is that the agonist is overactive. So therefore, it's not it's decreasing the neural drive to its functional antagonist to relax it. So therefore, it becomes overactive when we don't want it to be. Okay, that's, you know, again, force couple relationships, you know, that's where multiple muscles will move, move, keep joint structures intact and keep them from making unwanted movements that can lead to that poor bodily control, joint dysfunction, dysfunction, not a positive aspect there. Synergistic dominance. All right. More so we've, we kind of hit on this a little bit before, but it's where the synergists are the now main functioner when really it's simply because of the fact that the nervous system is like, well, I don't, you know, I can't move this muscle in the right way. So therefore I'm going to inhibit or back off on these prime movers. And I'm going to compensate by making the synergist more active at that point. So there's your muscle, you know, muscle imbalances. We talked about uh, arthrokinematic, so, you know, going back there to the second level arthrokinematic dysfunctions. That's what we're referring to here. It, you know, again, motion of the joint. So we're having the dysfunction of a joint movement at that point when we're talking about, you know, with muscle imbalances. So, um, you know, again, osteokinematic versus arthro. De uh, osteo is how the bones and joints move, where arthro is describes how the joint, you know, describes the motion of the joint surface. So like it says there on the top right, you see, well, we talked about those three earlier. Um, I believe maybe in chapter six where the roll, slide, and spin, all right? Roll, slide, and spin are arthrokinematic, adduction, extension, flexion, whatever mo joint motion you're talking about is osteokinematic. All right. So how do we prevent, you know, how do we make things work correctly? How do we work, have a good workaround? Well, you end up with the muscle spindles and the GTOs, which we call proprioceptors. Okay. The first one, the muscle spindle is exactly where it's found, found in the muscle. It detects stretch or length or speed of length change. So that's critical for that. So if we're trying to work on, if, if you were to take someone and move their hamstring and lay them on their back, bend their opposite leg, take their right leg and stretch it straight out. As you start getting up toward the top of that, you know the muscle spindle will actually kick back on you when you hit that certain stretch point where basically the muscle is saying, stop, don't go any farther. I don't like this, okay? So that's where proper tone comes into play, but you, you hold that contract, you go back off of where it kicked back from you, hold that for a few seconds, have them contract it against you, PNF, proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation, and then you come back down or even just general stretching, hold that stretch there for about 10 seconds, come back down, you know, kind of take that person's leg and kind of shake it out a little bit, go back. You should be able to, at that point, move that leg a little bit farther before the muscle spindle is a, is going to contract is going to cause that contraction again and that's the main part of the muscle spindles it's trying to do that repeatedly over and over again okay whereas the golgi tendon organs they're more about tension change you know so muscle tension and the speed of that tension golgi tendon organs found in the actual tendon itself okay 
So with flexibility, we're, we're talking about that length, you know, the lengthening action of everything. You know, when the muscles lengthen, there we talk about it, the muscle spindles activated. So therefore, we say the stretch reflex is activated. So therefore, what happens is when the stretch reflex is activated, you're stretching the right muscle, you're turning off the, you know, the, you know, the antagonist at that point. So therefore, the target muscles are, can be held and contracted in the right manner. At that point there, GTOs are signaled that will override that stretch reflex and then it'll relax the muscle in that positioning. All right. So even though that tension is being built up, the GTO is like, it's okay. You can lengthen because we're, we're in a better position. Okay. So we want to inhibit that muscle spindle to be able to provide a little bit more flexibility and range of motion as needed. So <clears throat> a little bit more, we talked about that cumulative injury cycle, which has led to, you know, improper flexibility. <clears throat> There's the cumulative injury cycle up on the left. So what we end up with is, you know, something occurs, we end up with tissue trauma, which leads to inflammation, okay, that swelling and that point tenderness. But if you look down here, the normal fibers have knots in them there, we call them adhesions. Those adhesions are part of that process where the inflammation leads to muscle spasming or involuntary contractions as you know, that aren't needed, which leads to those adhesions. Those adhesions make the muscle move incorrectly. Therefore, it leads to muscle imbalance, and then that cumulative injury cycle keeps progressing. Now you have something that's wrong with you based on this pattern overload, and so you end up having a problem with a constant issue of pain. Now, one of the things that we want to pay attention to, and I, there probably would be a question based off of um, you know, your, your physical test from NASM, is Davis's law, which revolves around the, the, the aspect of um, your soft tissue will remodel on the line of stress. So again, that inflammation is going to keep happening. That tissue trauma is going to keep happening. Davis's law is going to, you're going to, your soft tissue is going to want to constantly remodel, but you're constantly hurting muscle fibers. So it really kind of, you know, hurts that aspect there. So, you know, we have to be aware that we're trying to avoid all of these things by just being more flexible. So we have different types, okay? So these different types, self-myofascial release, uh, little, you know, a little more common, it would be called, you know, uh, you know, foam rolling, all right? Static stretching, active stretching, and then dynamic stretching, all right? All of those are part of NASM's process for trying to achieve this proper flexibility in any way, shape, or form. So self-myofascial release, there's some good examples here, but you know, the, the person on the left there, you know, what are we doing? We're, we're breaking up adhesions of the fascia, okay, that surround that muscle, that muscle tissue. And therefore, some of the ways, you know, foam rollers, they can be smooth or they can be um, smooth or they can have knobs on them. It doesn't really matter, okay? Um, so that's, one, that's part of the process there. Um, you can, and then by the smooth, either one doesn't really, some can provide a little bit different stimulus. Others may not. All right. Um, the other thing you can use is that, like it says a handheld stick. Okay. That's, you know, the top, the, the middle picture that's to the left. And then you can also, like it says there, that's a rumble roller. Um, that's another example of that is something more on the lines of like a lacrosse ball or a tennis ball or a golf ball. All right, that could be used in those manners as well. And again, what are we doing? We're providing a um, way to break up this fascia in that manner. Okay. So if you know, there's the the theory behind it. The mechanical part of it is that compression relaxes the tissues. The neurophysical physic. Wow. The neurophysiological component of that is that the compression influences tissues to relax, but and the pain around it, you'll basically call upon what we call the mechanoreceptors and pain receptors or noci receptors and those will kind of shut off so they're not feeling as much of that so in that moment you might feel a little bit of that distraction but at the same time you may end up with you know eventually that releasing of it of that pain at that point so there's some examples here of that self myofascial technique 
You can do your calves, you can do your quads, you can do your TFL, lats, peroneals, adductors, piriformis, hamstrings, the lateral thigh, and then the thoracic spine. So, you know, again, one to three sets, you know, held on that point of tenderness for about 30 seconds. All right, we're trying to make sure that we hold, so you're gonna roll and then on those areas, and as soon as you feel that point of tenderness, hold it. So you're gonna put the pressure down on it to hold. That's one of the mistakes that a lot of people make is they don't do the hold. So some precautions, you know, definitely pay attention to these because you will be tested upon them. Any of these would be, you know, so if you pause it here, you can see your exist. Um, there can be other interactions as well that might cause some problems. But understand that for the most part, these are the main um, precautions here. Varicose veins, sensitivity to pressure, elderly, right, medications that may alter a client's um, sensation. So all of these make a difference in what you're trying to achieve. So pay attention to these precautions. Contraindications, yeah, any skin issues, you know, wounds, osteoporosis, recent surgeries, acute infections. So a lot of these, again, they're going to be more in the moment for people, but make sure that we know what they're up against. Cancer patients, you know, they don't want them doing this because it could cause issues with the compression on those, those tumor sections. Other ones, connective tissue disorders, pregnancy. Pregnancy is going to, be, again, see where it says consult your physician. Pregnant women, you know, again, too much pressure can cause unwanted um, stimuli within the body. So therefore it could change, you know, it could, you know, potentially lead to early onset pregnancy that we don't really want. All right. But just remember, so consult your physician, you know, always err on the side of caution with a lot of these. So static stretching, the main purpose here, holding the point passively. All right. You're, you know, you're the one that's doing that for a minimum of 30 seconds. We can go longer if we want to. Um, that's not unheard of. But again, down in the bottom there, one to three sets, hold these stretch for about 30 seconds or longer, all right, depending upon toleration and of course experience. We don't want new people going, you know, for, for two minutes straight of a hold when they really shouldn't be because their muscles are not in that positioning. All right. So what's the point? The, the prolonged period of holding is meant to inhibit the muscle spindle, cause that relaxation, kind of let yourself get into that groove of feeling that stretch. All right. Now, again, we go to discomfort. We don't go to pain. That's the main thing. Discomfort, no pain. Here's some of those stretching areas. Now I'm going to pull up some of the pictures of this at this point, just so we can kind of get a better understanding of, you know, again, gastric nemia stretch, getting that back foot planted down. All right. That's one of them going into our soleus stretch. You know, if you look here again, trying to shift the weight a little bit, you're getting a little bit more of an angle. All right. But it's very similar to the gastric nemia stretch in its own right. Okay. Um, a static 90, 90 hamstring stretch. If you look there, just using, now we're using a, this is where we're using an implement, like a band. We can provide, by putting it in the center of the foot there, we can provide a little bit more stimulus to get a little bit more from a mild stretch to a little bit more aggressive stretch. So that can help. All right. Another one working with, you know, again, supine, this is biceps femoris where you're going to get your foot to come over a little bit. So again, straight position, working on kick, getting that leg back, but you're going to kick that leg over the midline of the body but you don't want to rotate the torso. You just want to get the hip to kind of come off the ground a little bit. There's your standing biceps femoris stretch. So you can see here, feet, hands come together and we work on moving ourselves in a rotational manner with a leg straight out and the toe pointed. More at ball adductor stretches. I tried this the other day just because I was kind of confused about it. And you know, when I saw the picture, I'm like, does it really work? But it does. You really feel that pull on that, if you look on this person's right leg, that right leg straight, you really do feel that pull on those adductors. Standing adductor, a little bit more like, um, a lot of times you might hear these called Cossack squats, C-O-S-S-O-C-K, and those can be a little bit more ballistic if you wanted them to be, be, or dynamic because you can go side to side with them. But again, trying to get into that, like basically a lateral lunge, but keep that left leg in this lady's position here or, or situation left leg straight so you feel that come through the center of the thigh or the uh the center part or the midline of the thigh static adductor magnus stretch here again very good very very good stretch here where you're getting yourself up onto like a 12 inch plyometric box and reaching down and stretching definitely feel that through that whole adductor region 
Static TFL, definitely another good one. I use this a lot as well. This person here, the only difference I would say is I see that that person has their leg a little bit in too much in line. I would just, it is a staggered stance, but I would get that back leg to be kicked over a little bit more lateral so you have a better base of support. And you really get that pull over and feel that through that right leg. That's where you would feel that is that back leg. Kneeling hip, hip flexor stretches, a lot of times, this is again kneeling, so you're not in motion. But these here, we are working with, um, we're talking about from this standpoint, no dynamic, but this is kind of the lower section of what we would call a Samson stretch. All right, so again, getting those hip flexors to really engage as needed. Now you could, to make this a little bit more challenging, you can bring that back leg a little bit farther back and get that front leg to be a little bit more stretched. That'll pull a little bit more on the hip flexors themselves. Paraformis, you've seen this before, I'm sure. Um, a lot of times, if you ever heard of the pigeon pose, you can do that in the seated position. Your erectors, working on that rotation, trying to get the spine to twist a little bit to pull and tighten up on the complete spinal area. <clears throat> Static ball lat, lat stretches. The more you drop your head, the more you, in, you, know, you really get that pull on that lat. Then, you know, again, that doorway stretch, your pec stretch, this is always a good one. Very, very optimal for just releasing of those uh, pecs, the pec major minor. Upper trap or scalenes. The difference here, though, if you look at this person, is you want to make sure that this, this right arm needs to be behind the back as you're pulling in the opposite manner. Okay, so you're still stretching the right side, but you need to use your left arm to stretch it. And then same premise, see this little bit better picture, arm behind the back pulling a little bit more to the side, okay, a little bit more lateral, is gonna get your, your levator group. Sternocleidomastoid, you wanna tilt that head up and pull backward, you're gonna get that front portion of the neck. All right, so these are all really good in terms of your static stretching, okay? So eventually we'll, we'll move into the active part, but for now, let's, you know, these are the ones that we kinda went through, <clears throat> but very, very good for what we're trying to achieve here. Okay, definitely trying to work really hard on making sure that, you know, we're, we're working everything accordingly and to do those 30 second or more holds. <clears throat> so there's a, there was a couple of those options we saw, but we got into a bunch of them as well. Active stretching on the hand, there's a one to three sets. You know, what are we doing here? We're holding that end range for about one to two seconds. Okay, that's the main point here is that we're going into that one to two second hold, and then we're gonna do about five to 10 reps. That's the difference there. We're not holding for 30 seconds at the end range. We're more concerned about one to doing, going through the range of motion, and then at that point there, when we go through that range of motion, we're gonna work on five to 10 sets with an end range of one to two seconds. Okay, that's the key there. Motor neuron excitability, and then we're creating that reciprocal inhibition of the muscle that's being stretched. We're turning off of, we're turning off the antagonist, turning on the prime mover. Again, a bunch of different areas that we can work with. These are your techniques. So with your, you know, again, like your gastrocnemius and everything like that, if we kind of scrolled through, but we'll go through, there's your soleus. So we're getting a little bit of that, you know, see you have proper foot positioning at that point is optimal because we need to work on, again, trying to work the, the, the back leg, which is your technically, at this point, the back leg is gonna be the critical point for you because that's the one that is, you know, as you're swinging through, that soleus is contracting in that manner with that flat foot, okay? And also as you move the motion of the rotation, you're also getting that back foot to be straight up and down, and that's gonna help with the, the, the calf itself. But then as you take that eversion, inversion of the ankle, that's really where you're gonna get that motion. Very, very critical for that. Active hamstring stretching here. If you look, now we're just working on ex, you know, flexing and extending the knee. That's the main point there. So that 90-90 stretch, same thing as we did before, but now we're just putting it a little bit more active. Kick it down into that 90 degree um, position of the knee, kick it back up, you know, controlled, hold for two seconds, go back down. So again, five to 10 seconds of, five to 10 seconds, five to 10 reps, one to two seconds of hold at the end range. 
your active supine biceps femoris stretch, if you noticed here, you're gonna go into again that, if you remember the first picture, all we're working on here is again, the same thing we just did in that last stretch, except now we're rotated over the midline, in and out 90 degrees, okay? Standing adductor stretch was kind of what I was talking about before, just being in that active sense. So you rotate through, hold for one to two seconds, stand back tall, and then repeat. So the, basically what you're doing is you're taking a lot of the previous stretches and you're adding the motion to it in a slight hold and then go from there. So again, there's that adductor stretch with the movement, back to returning and repeat. Active TFL stretch, same thing. Hold, come back down and repeat. All right, so that's gonna be the critical component there. Your active kneeling hip flexor stretch is very similar to that in that manner where again, you're gonna be in that active position and you're going to work with trying to con you know, constantly move to and from that positioning so that you stay you know, engaged the whole time and then return and then do it again. So again, five to 10 reps, one to two seconds held at the last point, okay? And then there's your active lat stretch. That lat, again, pushing that ball out, dropping the head a little bit, pushing it back through. Active pec stretch. So again, uh, basically moving forward slightly with that body and then releasing back through. Okay, that's the key point there. So just, it's, and it's a repeat and then come back to rest. All right, and then you know, again, the upper trap, this, you know, the scalenes, the levators, again, we're just being a little bit less. We're going to hold one to two seconds and then repeat. Hold, a, you know, one to two seconds, then, re re then repeat. Scalenes, levator, scapula, sternocleidomastoid. So, again, all of the ones that we did earlier, but just understanding that in that moment, we're, you know, we're just taking that static stretch and making it a hold at the very end for one to two seconds and then repeat. So we're kind of progressing from a static into like a slight dynamic, but just a little bit different, just a little bit different. And there's your dynamic. So we'll kind of, we'll kind of hit on that for a little bit here, but we'll pull up some of the, the options that you can see in a second. But dynamic is going to be full with motion. Now this is going to mimic a lot of what you're going to be doing when you're working out. So, you know, again, dynamic, Research wise, dynamic stretching is very critical because of the fact that it does show to improve performance. And I'm not just talking about sports performance, but just movement performance in general. So dynamic stretching is always optimal before you, you do any sort of exercise. Static stretching usually beforehand. So rule of thumb, self myofascial release and dynamic stretching before self myofascial release and, and static stretching post. Active stretching can also be used before as well, okay? So what is your options here? One, one set, 10 to 15 repetitions for that particular muscle group, and then three to 10 exercises that we can do. Just, again, be more specific to the regions that you're trying to achieve. So prisoner squats, you know, and then move on down from there. You know, a lot of these are gonna be very similar to what, you know, you might know of as, you know, generalized movements. Okay, so let's start off at the top. Prisoner squats, basically getting, you wanna make sure that you get proper depth here, but using and opening up that chest is gonna be really critical for this as well. Okay, really getting in that spine in there as well. Different planes of motion, lunging. Okay, you can also do lunging with a rotation. Okay, but again, you're, you can either do walking lunges, you can do, you know, walk, you know, walk in place, meaning you step back to start and then go back out. All right, those are just a few of the lunging variations, tube walking, band walking, whichever way you want to call it, but putting that band, you know, getting those glutes, the glute medius to really fire up on these or the your abductors in particular. Really, really good for a, a squat day because sometimes we don't realize how much we need those glute medius muscles to be able to function. Um, this is just a general good exercise and, you know, just for general purposes, even if it's not for stretching. Leg swings. <clears throat> always positive. Um, you can do forward leg, front to back leg swings. You can do side to side leg swings. All right. Those are always key as well. Making sure you're holding on Frankenstein's. We usually consider, I usually work with opposite arm to opposite leg. They're using, you know, they're just using both arms and both legs, you know, while you're walking to and from. 
So either one is correct, but this one here, they're doing two, which alleviates the need to do opposites. So, um, but again, very controlled. High knees, you know, I call these knee tucks. Um, well, no, I call no, I really call them uh, walk, walk to knee to chest, basically walking knees to chest. Um, and that, you know, again, you're a little bit moving, but you're, you're trying to stay in control, trying to keep yourself as upright as possible. Um, push-ups with the rotation, I call these the push-ups to a T. Okay, you're basically making a T with your body. Ball rush and twist, a little bit different here, trying to work on a little bit of, you know, trunk rotation, working on those you know, obliques, working on your glutes, your particularly your glute maximus. All right, so very, you know, very, very lightweight ball you need. Arm circles, jumping jacks, you can do different variations of jumping jacks. All right, jump roping is always cool because it just, again, it's a very really good cardio base if you use it correctly, but it's also really good to get the lower limbs to get, you know, the, the lower body, the lower, the legs basically to get warm completely from hip down. Um, so, you know, that's, that. those are your dynamic stretches, okay? So, you know, really good quality movements. Um, they're definitely worth, again, making sure you pay attention to the areas that are under attack that for your workout that you're going to be doing for that day. So controversial stretches, there's a, there's a few of them. Straight leg toe touches. But again, if this is more, take these controversial stretches with a grain of salt because if you're a person who has already good flexibility, then, you know, we can work in these areas. But straight leg toe touches, you're basically that's called a saddle position up in the top right or arching, you know, or arching quadriceps. Um, bottom left there is the hurdler stretch. The, the one in the middle there, this is what we would call a yoga plow. And then a shoulder stand. A lot of these are compromising because it depends on the person. But again, a lot of these, um, like a plow and yoga, that's for people who do yoga. A shoulder stand, haven't really seen that a lot lately um, in terms of that, you know, that dynamic base. So again, a lot of these aren't really used to a full extent anymore. But, you know, if you look at that sing the straight leg toe touch, that person is just putting themselves in a compromised position anyway, instead of being, you know, neutral spine, neutral neck, and just trying to follow the line of the, of the leg. So take those for what they're worth. All right. So, you know, flexibility is really key and critical for ourselves, but just make sure that we're paying attention to, you know, the person that we're working with, what we're really having them try to achieve and what is their ultimate goal, you know, but again, everybody should be doing flexibility. Everybody, you know, start with two to three times a day, build up to five to seven times per uh, five, excuse me, two to three times per week with new people is always optimal. Five to seven days per week is what you want to build up to. And everybody who is a trainer should be following that same rule. And that's one thing that I lacked a lot when I, you know, during certain times of my, you know, my exercise career is I just didn't handle it correctly. But I regret that. Not that I'm injured now, but I'm, you know, I wish I would have maintained it while I was doing specific things like powerlifting, for example. I neglected it a lot and really kind of, you know, looking back at now as I do more flexibility work, wish I would have done it when I was younger and, and, and a little bit dumber in that way. So, um, you know, again, just be aware that the flexibility is not something you want to overlook and you want to just maintain it as best as you possibly can and try to be as mobile as you can as well. So... I thank you all for listening. Um, I really, I really do. I really appreciate you taking the time to continue to listen to these. Chapter 13 was the first. Chapter 14 of flexibility is your, your, stand, your next standpoint. Moving on to chapter 15, which is your um, cardio-based. All right. So I hope you have a great day and talk soon.